grace to you and peace from God our Creator, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now before I begin, I've got to tell you, my means of, I guess, call it a confession. <laughs> Sermons like this one are not easy for me. Because texts like these are not easy for me. I tell folks that I'm in shape because round is a shape. <laughs> Yet if you were watching just now, you saw with what difficulty I got up out of the pew to come up here. My doctor has asked me if I understand what the words morbidly obese mean. Yeah, doc, I understand. Shut up, I want to go get ice cream now. <laughs> I'm a member of a 12-step group of Readers Anonymous. I attend meetings every Monday night, and from time to time, if I feel it fits in with the text, I will share some of my own story with my message. I try not to do it too much, because I don't want this to be about me, but rather about God's Word. But today kind of fits. If you have any familiarity at all with the 12-step process, you know that the first step is the acknowledgement of the need. Much like Romans chapter 3, where Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short. In fact, the 12 steps originally by Dr. Bill were written based on the book of Romans. We admit that we are powerless over fill in the blank, food, gambling, drugs, alcohol, and our lives have become unmanageable. It's the realization that self-control doesn't work. Now, I love my mother with all my heart. But whenever I call and talk to her, she always asks, Kenneth, how you doing on your diet? <laughs> my diet's fine, but you know, I don't always follow it. Well, Kenneth, all you need is some self-control. <laughs> Ma, if I had self-control, I wouldn't be fat. Okay? I'm fat because I don't have self-control. We don't have as many sausages to serve this morning as you might think we do. <laughs> you gave me a couple to sample at lunch yesterday. When you went to the store, I wanted to verify the quality of those sausages. <laughs> so I had another. That's how a compulsive person operates. Even though we know better, we do it anyhow. Much like with sin. We know better. But we do it anyhow. And the second step of the process acknowledges that there is a power greater than ourselves, capable of restoring us to sanity. Amen. Now, that's actually a very biblical phrase if you think to Jesus' story about the prodigal son in Luke 15. The guy went off, he spent his father's inheritance, wastefully lived, ran out of money, and had to be abased. And then Luke tells us, when he had come to his senses, in other words, when he came out of his temporary insanity, I have no problem with steps one and two. I might as well climb Mount Everest than deal with step three. I turn my life and will over to God. I don't want to. I want my will. I want it when I want it. I'm like a spoiled, petulant child. Who wants what he wants when he wants it? Simply because he wants it. It's kind of humbling to have to deal with my four-year-old granddaughter and realize I behave the same way. I've been a Christian for many, many years. And one of the things I've realized is that making a decision for Christ is not a one-time event. It must happen over and over again. Now you're going to hear in our passages about St. Paul calling us to die to sin and live to Christ. And that is so beautifully expressed in many churches' teachings when they talk about the need to be born again. It's that decision to put this behind and focus this way. 
But being still sinful, we tend to meander along the path God has set out for us. In fact, sometimes we turn around and go back the other way. <laughs> Typically, the day before I want to make a commitment to healthy eating, I'll stop for some dipping Dots. <laughs> you know, one last binge before I start eating sensibly. Talk about temporary insanity. Or if I eat too much at lunch, well, today's blown. I'm about to have a pizza for supper. And I'll start again tomorrow. You know, you play as soon as instead of as if. And this morning's text from the sixth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans speaks specifically to that kind of twisted mentality that rejects the God that created us and makes ourselves our own God. Because isn't that exactly what we're doing when God says, do this, and we say, I don't think so. We're putting ourselves in God's place. What we need is freedom from ourselves. Freedom from our own will. On the 28th of August, in the year 1963, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Hundreds of thousands of people gathered to hear this great orator speak. And he spoke about freedom and equality. And in the concluding portion of his speech, he announced to the people that he had a dream. And I'm not even going to pretend to try and preach it the way he did. I tell my freshmen it's probably one of the greatest speeches ever written. Not just in terms of its content, but its structure. But he says, I have a dream. And his dream was that someday the people of the United States would live in equality. Little black girls with little black boys and white girls and white boys. So that someday we'll be able to sing the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. Now whether we are black, white, Latino, Asian, male, female, young, old, or older, <laughs> we all long for the time when we will be free. Truly free. And the words of the song Dr. King quoted refer to the ending of our life on this earth, when we will be free from a life of servitude and will spend eternity in the arms of Jesus. Amen. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could experience that kind of freedom on this side of heaven? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when we meet people, we encounter folks who are anything but free. A poet that I enjoy presenting to my English students, written by David Thoreau, where he writes, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Wow. There's a song of freedom in my heart. But unless I let it out, it dies with me. In doing grief counseling with folks, I can't tell you how many times people have played the what-if game. And if you've ever read the landmark book on death and dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know that one of the aspects <coughs> of the grief process is the what-if game. If only I could have seen Dad before he died. If only I could have told her one more time that I loved her. If only this, if only that, and now it's too late. And so we have to live with probably the most useless of all emotions, guilt. Mm -hmm. 
because guilt never motivates us to do anything positive. It's like sandbags that weigh us down. Now, is it possible to live a life that is guilt-free? Is it possible to live a life with the freedom that God chooses for us to have? Do you hear that? Chooses for us to have? God does not intend us to live lives of quiet desperation, but rather to be free at last. It's like Paul wrote in the beginning of the, his letter to the Galatians. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Do not let yourselves be burdened again. Hey, Ken, did you, are you, did you find the wallet you lost? Yeah, but I'm still looking. Hmm. How stupid does that sound? But yet how many of us, having been given the treatment we need, the cure for our illness, go right back to living the way we did when we were sick? Our prayers are with our brother Santiago this morning because he's chosen not to take his medication. He and I are going to have a chat about that when I go see him later on today. Because it doesn't make sense if the solution is there for you to turn it away and try something else. But yet, while you're all bobbing your heads like a bunch of little birds, we're all no different. For we hear God's message of forgiveness, and yet we go right on sinning. Not just because we're slaves to it, not just because we crave freedom, but because we choose it. Because that's how we want it, even if we don't like it, even if it's not healthy for us. So Paul is writing to a Christian congregation in Rome, and he's encountered a situation where people have responded to his gospel message. Where he's told them, salvation is not dependent upon behavior, but rather God's grace. And there are those who took that to an unhealthy extreme and said, well, then I can keep right on sinning. Because if I sin and God forgives, then I can just keep sinning. And God will keep forgiving. I've told you before about that one Marine who came to see me years ago on a Thursday so he could confess to me all the sins he intended to commit on Friday and Saturday. Because <laughs> he was afraid he might be too hungover to make it to Mass on Sunday morning. You can't play a game like that. You can't say, well, I'll just keep on sinning and then I'll go ask God for forgiveness. Because if you know that's what you're doing, and you do it anyhow, you're basically saying to God, I don't need you. I'm going to live life on my terms. And so what we must do is confess our sinfulness and our need to God. And stop acting out in rebellion against God's will. Because Paul is describing for us the new life that we can have with God. It doesn't have to be the old way. It doesn't have to be the way it was yesterday, or the week before, or the year before, or the decade before. You can have your new life now. The idea that we would experience freedom when we die is available to us this morning. And all we have to do is accept God's invitation. Because living to God is a freedom. Living to God is a life called outside of ourselves. It's a life that lives in relationship with God. It's a life responding to God's overwhelming grace and steadfast love. There was a Bible Institute in modern-day India where Dr. Samuel Thomas, the director of the Institute, had a rather interesting graduation ceremony for his students. Those who had finished their studies and were now about to leave gathered for one final 
ceremony. And in their commencement, and he always preferred to call it a commencement rather than a graduation, because graduation says, I'm done. Kind of like confirmation for Lutherans. <laughs> commencement says, this is where I begin. And he would have them rise and repeat the following words. Today I stand as a dead man. I declare that in Jesus Christ, I am saved by his blood, and thus I am dead to sin, and no longer dead in my sin. Today I stand and declare that I surrender my will and my life to his will and his life. I shall go where he sends me without asking questions. I shall go to whomever he sends me without seeking fame. I will preach to everyone even if they hate me. I am an ambassador of the cross and must deliver the message. I shall pour my life out to reach my family, my friends, my neighbors, and my city. I embrace the shame of the cross and I revere nothing but God. I welcome suffering, shame, persecution, beatings, imprisonment, and death but I will not be silenced. If I am killed, I pray that my blood should be a harvest for souls. This is my city, I dare not do less. And following the commencement ceremony, each of the students is given three things. A new Bible, a new bicycle, and a one-way train ticket to their field of service. They have no plan B, hmm. and neither should we. As I've said, this summer's sermon themes will be based on the work of God's Holy Spirit within us. A spirit that calls us through the gospel and leads us to accept God's gift of grace and then guides us from there. A few weeks ago, we heard Jesus in the Gospel of John promising the disciples that he would send a teacher who would reveal to them what God wanted them to know. Now, I'm not putting down Bible class or Sunday school, but we've got a pretty good teacher already in God's Holy Spirit. If we'll shut up and listen, if we'll do what we're told, it's said that Martin Luther once had an interesting analogy. The old Adam, meaning our sinful self, is a mighty good swimmer. You could drown him in the waters of baptism. He's going to come back up and swim some more. I remember when I was a kid, I used to ask my Sunday school teacher what I had to do to get the devil to leave me alone. Because even as a kid, I would sneak out into the kitchen at night and grab something to eat. Not because I was hungry, but I wanted to do. And her answer was always to me, never. You will never be free of the devil's temptation as long as you are alive. But you need not worry or be concerned about that. Because when you were baptized, God placed his spirit in you. The spirit of Jesus. The spirit of the one who has already defeated devil. It's like having a big brother walk with you to help face the bullies. I assume that's what you guys would do if the smallest among you was being challenged by bullies. You know, that's how it was in our family. You face one, you face all. We can fight with each other. But don't let anybody from the outside mess with any of us. Because then you had to face all of us. Baptism of the Holy Spirit marks for us the end of the old way of life and gives us a new way of life. Now, I knew a lot of sailors in my Navy ministry who claimed to be Christians but never worshipped never read the Bible, and as far as I know, never prayed. 
Although they could argue that they would be able to commit sin and get forgiven later, kind of like that one fellow I was just telling you about. You see, they're playing games with God. I reject what you want for me to do now. I'm going to do what I want, but then I'll come back to you later and say, I'm sorry. In the first two verses of our text for today, Paul declares, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. Those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? What we need to be developing is what Paul would call an attitude of gratitude. It's recognizing what God has done for us. He says in verse 4, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I'm sorry, that's Galatians 5. And then in Romans, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. I don't know if you're a country music fan at all. I sent my sister a birthday card this morning. She lives in Wisconsin and she loves all that normal twang and music. <laughs> Actually, I do too. I just like teasing her about it. Johnny Cash had two dogs. And he called those dogs redemption and sin. Sin was a black dog with a white stripe. And he said that described his life before Jesus. It was dark. <coughs> and it was trapped in sin. But nevertheless, there was God's call to him. The other dog was white with a black stripe. He called it redemption. Mm -hmm. And his explanation was, I have been saved by Jesus, but the temptation to sin is always there with me. We gather today to celebrate God's blessings, to rejoice in the freedom he's given us, and to make a commitment to God that we will live out our freedom each and every day from this day forward. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. We worship God with our offering.